We go directly to Damascus, Syria. We're joined by a Syrian activist who agreed to speak on the program on the condition we do not disclose her name. We can, we can, I can sense that people here do not look for other state support, you know, countries, states. Um, we look for people support. We value so people solidarity. We want the people to go on the streets and to support their revolutions anywhere in the world, not just in Syria. We don't trust government. We don't trust politicians. Um, and this has been very clear um, over the very last six months when protesters are taking the streets and raising the banners, saying that we don't even care about your statements, Sofiana or Pegula Clinton. We only care about the people, um, the people of the world, um, the Egyptian people, the Yemeni people, the Bahraini people, um, and, and other people in the world. Um, I think People's support is meaningful the most at this moment. Um, the people here, and let's just not say the people, let's just say the street, the rebel, the rebel street, have given up on the on the world support, and they're not even looking for them anymore. They just, I mean, I'm just going to say it frankly, they're just looking for so, armed um, support. We, I mean, there has been a decision. Um, it's not very new. It just it has become clear, I think, four or five months ago that we want to get rid of this, of this regime alone. We want to do it alone, just give us arms, and let's just finish our job. Um, that's the kind of general street um, you know, feeling. Uh, yeah, I think that's So you don't want to see outside intervention? No. Um, you know— um, some people were, I mean, even the Syrian streets, some of some of the areas in the Syrian streets were looking for intervention, but that's because they've seen the Libyan um, um, model, and they think that this is going to be happening very soon. And people don't know the, the you know, what happens in, in Libya afterwards. But now, I think it's very evident that the Syrian street has known very well how uh, politicians and, and um, um Powerful countries think and act, and um, and they they only care about their interests in the region, and we know exactly what we mean by that. So, and to be honest here, I have to I have to say this very important: people here think that the United States um, and Turkey and some powerful countries um, in the world will get into Syria after Assad falls. This is the general feeling here in the Syria in Syria. And that I'm saying this to let you know that this is how far the Syrian street has become suspicious of the calls of intervention. Um, so yeah, no, we, we're yeah, I mean, we're not we're not definitely not looking for intervention. We're and, just looking for support. And how how organized uh, is the street? Are you with other people as you talk about moving from place to place, not wanting to use your cell phone so you can't be identified, using proxies when you're using the internet, etc.? Um, no, it's, it's not very organized, to be honest. It's, it's, it's not organized because there are uh, problems. Security problems, safety problems. Um, you, you have to—I don't know how to say this. It's just— um, the more you have, you are scared to be um, tracked and and to be um, uh, taken, uh, 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 detained. The more you you don't know how to how, how to organize yourself. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm trying to say this right, but um, because of the very pressure on us activists in the streets, there isn't room, a lot of room for us to organize. But we're trying our best. Um, we're trying our best to organize ourselves, and I and I think we're at perfect access, to be honest. Um, but there are heroes on the street. There are beautiful heroes on the street. There are doctors who know that that by just crossing the street, there there's a sniper in the street. They know they might get hit, but there's no way but to cross the street to help to help a, an injured person. Finally, um, finally, you yeah. said you're not you're against intervention. You're looking for support. What do you mean by that? No, I am against intervention. I mean, um, if here, look, the the battle now has there has no there is no demonstration right now in Damascus. There is no way we can demonstrate and protest peacefully. 
the battle has become um, military. It's not just between the Free Syrian Army and the regime, but also with the, with the, with the neighborhoods that are protecting and and welcoming the Free Syrian Army. And this is this is something that maybe a lot of people in the West don't understand that the relationship between the Free Syrian Army and the neighborhoods, the rebel neighborhoods. But that's maybe another topic we can talk about. But what I mean is, no, it, it, not just me, but the people here in Syria. The rebel street, the revolutionaries, are against intervention. But what they want is armed support to send us guns, weapons to defend ourselves, to get rid, to get, to protect the families, to protect the neighborhoods, and to and to finish this regime. I mean, this is this is we're talking about a regime that is bombing residential neighborhoods. It's it's just not a joke. So we need weapons to protect ourselves. There's just no other way. Um, and in that sense, what we look for, we don't want people to come to our, to our country. Um, we just want people to send us guns and protect our own country. That's that's what we're looking for. We want to thank you very much for being with us, for risking this interview. Um, you have had a difficult history in Syria. Thank you very much. Um, when we come back, we're going to go to a reporter who's just returned from Syria, David Enders, and we'll be speaking with a professor who has written a book about Bashar al-Assad. This is Stay Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We're staying on Syria. We're joined by reporter David Enders. David Enders um, is a special correspondent for McClatchy, based in Beirut, Lebanon. He's been to Syria four times this year, most recently in June, returning to Lebanon, Syria shortly. Dave, what is your assessment of what's happening in Syria, the significance of the attack yesterday, the killing of the inner circle, and uh, the situation on the ground, as, as you listen to our guest from Damascus right now on Democracy Now! audio stream? Well, I think what's happening is, is this is really the trajectory of things for probably the last six months. We've seen the, uh, the rebellion grow um, in numbers and as far as its, its organizational capability, and they've attempted to strike at Assad and his inner circle multiple times. Uh, this is the first time they've been successful. Uh, we've seen this week the fighting officially move to Damascus. For the first time, we've seen the government actually shell neighborhoods inside the city proper, as it's done um, during fierce fighting in some of the suburbs over the last six months and in parts of the country like Homs, further outside Damascus. But I, I think what we're seeing is just the, the government crumbling under, under the weight of a massive rebellion. It simply can't put it down. Uh, David, I'd like to ask you about this report that the uh, uh, Israeli uh, intelligence chief told a closed session of the Israeli parliament that that uh, they believe that there is an, inc uh, an increasing number of jihadists and al Qaeda uh, 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 activists who have begun to move into Syria, uh, and that, uh, from the Israeli intelligence uh, viewpoint, they fear uh, radical Islam gaining the upper hand in within the Syrian rebellion. Well, uh, that's been a concern from outside Syria since the beginning of the rebellion. Um, and as the borders become more porous um, and the government becomes weaker, the potential that, that people with various agendas will infiltrate the country does increase. Um, what I've seen in my time amongst the rebels is that there are people who code as conservative um, religious uh, Islamists. There are people who code as jihadis. But the what's happening is people are fighting to bring down the government. If there are splits in the the rebel ranks um, between people who see um, a more uh, Islamic-based government or a more religious-based government as opposed to a more secular government, we're going to see that manifest itself after after the government falls. And as, as Syrians uh, try to decide what the government looks like after Assad, um, I mean, I've seen very uh, few foreign fighters. Um, I haven't met any personally. I've talked to, to a bunch of people who have, you know, said that they're there or, or talked to leaders of groups who, who have confirmed that they're present. Um, but, I mean, the uprising is, is made up of Syrians who are fighting to topple their own government. 
Dave Enders, I wanted to play a clip of the video report you did for Dan Rather's show, Dan Rather Reports. It discusses the ongoing conflict in Syria between forces loyal to Bashar al-Assad and the opposition forces seeking to drive him from power. Let's go to that clip. It's a hot night in early June. Rebel fighters are preparing for battle in a rural outpost in central Syria. They load homemade bombs, made of propane tanks and fertilizer, into a car that will bring them closer to enemy lines. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. A boy, too young to fight, watches as the rebels amass arms for a fifth day of fighting. Their goal? Eject a group of Syrian soldiers from the center of a town called Kafr Zeta. With this, we are attacking Bashar's army. They are attacking civilians and children. We are going to Bashar's mother with this. The town is on the border of an area that today is largely controlled by the rebels. It's just after dawn on the next morning. The streets of Kafir Zayda are almost completely deserted. All but a few civilians have fled the town. Rebel fighters planted their bombs a few hours before and are now taking their position. The Syrian armed forces are planning to raid this town. We've heard they have about 40 vehicles. We're planning this for them. Soon, a firefight begins. The rebels intend to stand their ground. Dan Rather narrating Dave Ender's report from the ground in Syria. Um, as you listen to our guest on the ground uh, in Damascus, talking about no intervention but support for the people fighting against the regime, actual armed support, uh, your thoughts and who is doing this and how common is that call, Dave? Well, I think that uh, most Syrians, most people in the opposition, armed and unarmed, uh, gave up on the idea of international military intervention some months ago. And, and what you're seeing um, in that footage with those guys planting bombs is essentially the contingency plan. Um, without the aid of the international community, Syrians are, are largely doing it themselves. Um, this has become a very widespread, in many parts of the country, um, grassroots uh, insurgency or rebellion, or they call it a revolution. Um, and so, as I was listening to, to the woman from Damascus, what concerns me most is the fact that these neighborhoods where the fighting is taking place are places that are already overburdened, overcrowded with refugees from all over the country. I mean, one thing that, that really struck me um, as I was in Syria, was that, that we are just not able to see the extent of, of the crisis that is occurring there with regards to uh, internal displacement, especially. Um, and so, you know, I noticed a number of people yesterday saying, well, where are, where are people going to go now? And I think that's, that's a very important question. Um, what's happening there, it's, it's just extremely serious, and aid is not reaching many of these people. Dave Enders, I want to thank you for being with us. Special correspondent for McClatchy, based in Beirut, Lebanon, has been in Syria a number of times this past year, returning shortly. As we turn now to our next guest, continuing our conversation on Syria in the wake of Wednesday's bomb blast that killed the top Syrian officials in Damascus, we're going to San Antonio, Texas, where we're joined by David Lesh, author of Assad's biography, The New Lion of Damascus, Bashar al-Assad in Modern Syria. His forthcoming book is called Syria, The Fall of the House of Assad. Uh, he's professor of Middle East history at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. Professor Lesh, welcome to Democracy Now. Tell us who Bashar al-Assad is. Well, he's someone I think who started out with uh, good intent. Now, there are people who argue with that, thinking that he was the evil dictator from the beginning. 
that I was able to meet with him uh, frequently over a number of years. And I think he is someone who, in the beginning, people had high hopes and great expectations, and probably too many high expectations, as it turned out. Uh, I found him personally to be unprepossessing, uh, unpretentious, even self-deprecating. But over the years, I, I saw him grow into the position and become much more comfortable with power. And I don't mean that uh, in a good way. And, and what often happens is that uh, with uh, authoritarian leaders and in, in authoritarian structures is that uh, an alternate reality is constructed or orchestrated around this person by his sycophants, by those around him who praise him on a daily basis. And being only human, people tend to start to believe that they are something close to a prophet sent to save uh, the country. And I think he started to believe the press, believe the propaganda. Uh, and, uh, and so when he, in all of his speeches since the uprising began, when he says that, uh, uh, you know, that the uprising is the result of pernicious forces from the outside, uh, working with unwitting accomplices on the inside, trying to unseat the regime, I think he actually believes these things, he, he and his supporters. Uh, because of this alternate world that he sees that's divorced from reality. And, and David Lesh, uh, what about uh, this issue that he's, uh, at least Syria has been been seen for decades as a, a more moderate uh, force within the, the, uh, the Middle East and the Arab world, certainly more tolerant than, let's say, the Saudi monarchy or the, uh, yet uh, this uh, enormous rebellion now, popular uprising, has arisen there, whereas Saudi Arabia remains remarkably uh, calm in the face of the uh, continued Arab Spring. Well, Saudi Arabia had uh, about $130 billion that the monarchy injected into the uh, economy soon after the Arab Spring began, just to, to calm the population and basically as a national bribe to prevent any sort of uprising from occurring. Syria, uh, a country that does not have uh, the riches of Saudi Arabia or the oil, uh, you know, had no such luxury. Uh, and it is an authoritarian system, and, and we see that the the, especially the so-called secular republics across the Middle East, across the Arab world, are, are the ones that have been hit uh, the hardest and, and the quickest. Uh, the Syrian regime, for a variety of reasons, has been able to withstand uh, the uprising longer than, say, Mubarak in Egypt or Gaddafi in, in Libya, uh, primarily because the military security apparatus has remained loyal to the regime, uh, and for a host of, of other reasons, and, and perhaps most of all, their willingness to, to make that decision uh, that there was a security solution from the very beginning, and, and that they would crack down and repress uh, brutally uh, the uprising over time. David Lash, I want to ask you about how uh, President Assad has framed the uprising against him. This is a rare German interview in a public broadcaster ARD earlier this month. Assad said most of the people being killed in the country are sympathetic to his regime. If you want to know who uh, killed, you have first to know who has been killed. We cannot tell about the criminal without knowing about the victims. Those victims that you're talking about, the majority of them are government supporters. So how can, can you be the criminal and the victim at the same time? The majority are people who support the government, and large part of the others uh, are innocent people who have been killed by different uh, groups in Syria. Assad went on to explain who he holds responsible for the Hula massacre in May, where, according to the United Nations, 108 people were killed, including 34 women and 49 children. Gangs came in hundreds from outside the city, not from inside the city, and they attacked the city. And they attacked the law enforcement forces unit inside the city. And then they killed uh, many families and, as you mentioned, children and women. Uh, and actually, those families that's been killed, they are uh, government supporters, not opposition. That is uh, President Assad, David Lesh. Uh, explain his view, and also when you changed your view of Bashar al-Assad. Mm -hmm. Well, this is consistent with the narrative of the regime since the beginning of the uprising, his explanation that he gave uh, in that interview. And one of the saddest things, personally, for me, is that Bashar did have a genuine aquifer of support in the country early on, uh, and he mortgaged all of that uh, when he chose, uh, instead of uh, uh, implementing dramatic reform at the beginning of the, up, of the uprising, he chose to crack down. And so he lost his mandate to rule. Uh, he lost his legitimacy uh, to rule. For me, uh, on another personal level, I saw this change in particular in 2007. 
uh, in the, his reelection, quote unquote, uh, which was a referendum uh, with, where he was the only one running uh, for another seven year term. And I met with him during the election process. Uh, and he had a kind of cathartic moment with me where he really started he, I could see he really believed the propaganda. And, it, and at that moment, I remember thinking specifically to myself that he's now president for life, uh, that he's he drank the Kool-Aid, uh, that power is an aphrodisiac, uh, and that uh, rather than changing the system that many of us had hoped from the very beginning, the authoritarian system had actually changed him. This killing of his inner circle yesterday and what this means as it comes closer and closer to the palace, um, can you talk about how the his father ruled, Hafez al-Assad, and the killing, particularly in 82, the massacre of thousands in Hama? Could you think we could see anything like uh, this happening all at once? I mean, thousands have already been killed even now in this last 16 months. That, that's my big fear right now, uh, in the wake of the bombing yesterday. The regime is going to come out, uh, as we saw in the interview uh, or the statement by the, the new minister of information in Syria. You know, he said they are going to punish whoever did this. Uh, you know, authoritarian regimes always want to be seen as strong and acting from a position of strength. My fear is that they'll act convulsively uh, and lash out in a in a way that casts a wide net. Uh, certainly, there are those in the military security apparatus loyalist to uh, uh, Assad's uh, brother-in-law, Asaf Shaukat, who used to be the head of military intelligence in Syria for many years, uh, they could lash out uh, without regard for what uh, the president uh, uh, wants to do or wants to see. Unfortunately, you know, from the, from the regime's point of view and from, from the opposition's point of view, it's, it's a calibration of bloodletting, where the regime wants to repress the rebellion, but n repress the rebellion but does not want to engage in any massacres that might galvanize or compel the international community to act more assertively than it has already. Uh, however, in, in the wake of yesterday, uh, my fear is that something could happen close to what happened in 1982 in Hama, and then the international community will be faced with a very difficult decision on whether or not to, to uh, militarily intervene. David Lesh, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Author of Assad's biography, The New Line of Damascus, Bashar al-Assad in Modern Syria, as well as the forthcoming book, Syria, The Fall of the House of Assad, professor of Middle East History at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas.